So yes, Dr. John Cheek spoke to us before. He spoke to us about some of the related issues to what we're going to talk about today. I mean, he's tracing the uh, specific, it's, it goes into the world was his dissertation. And from that, then he connected into some of the Genesis 315 uh, details and traced the biblical theology out. Well, anyway, it's kind of interesting because that comes up in the end of, at the end of Romans with, I think, a case of intertextuality that's underappreciated. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I was really excited that uh, he was willing to take this and trace it for us, and we're going to benefit massively from it. So let me see if I can get uh, Pastor Alexis to pray for us, and then after that, let's go straight into the time and uh, look forward to what we're going to learn today. Let's pray. Our gracious God and love, we're so thankful your for your kindness, for your graciousness, for us two to three months that we're studying your word. We're thankful for all the teachers. We're thankful for Dr. Joel for his course, uh, for everyone who participated. For sure that um, we can study deep your and we are so grateful that these things is available in spite of uh, difficulties that we have because of the pandemic and we ask for your guidance guidance we ask for your wisdom we ask for uh, the undivided attention that we will put into and help us lord as we study your word help stir creek in helping us just uh, passages in your scripture and help us lord as we learn together to be uh, humble enough to accept it and apply it and that you'll be able to um, use it for the body of christ and for your glory we thank you lord and we praise you for your goodness and kindness to us and please we pray in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen thank you all right. Well, thank you, Joel. I'm happy to uh, be here again, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so hopefully, uh, it's beneficial for uh, for all of you. I know I've uh, learned a lot as I've uh, been studying this more in uh, preparation for for this class. So uh, I just uh, you feel free to ask questions as uh, questions arise, and um, let's get right to it. Um, just so we all know uh, what focus is uh, today, um, we're going to be in Romans chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at primarily one verse in the chat in Romans 16, but it, it's in a paragraph. So um, I'll go ahead and display um, what we're going to be focusing on today. So with Romans chapter 16, uh, the first 16 verses include a number of different greetings uh, for people in the church. Um, and then Paul moves on to an appeal in verse 17. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. And then here's sort of the key verse we're going to be focusing in on today. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so this is sort of, uh, you know, the conclusion of the book of Romans. And uh, this statement here is, is a pretty significant statement theologically. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. This is what the whole Bible has been looking forward to ever since Genesis 3, is for God to crush uh, Satan, who has caused uh, so much trouble in the human race. Um, what's interesting, though, is that, as Joel mentioned, um, this verse and the, the content of this verse doesn't seem to get 
a ton of attention in, in some treatments of the book of Romans. Um, and so we're going to be looking into that and we're, we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, most commentators uh, agree that um, there is an Old Testament uh, foundation uh, behind uh, this verse in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And most commentators agree that uh, Genesis 3.15 is that reference. So um, Genesis 3.15 is, of course, the seed promise where God promises, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you, sh and you shall bruise his heel. And so the idea here is that this bruising of the serpent's head here is what is in view when Paul says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan. And uh, most commentators agree that this is the, the reference that Paul is referring to. Um, however, again, like I said, uh, some commentators don't give much attention to it. There are several questions uh, that I think we need to address in, relations, in relation to this verse. Um, one of them is, why does Paul refer to God as the God of peace? Um, is there any significance there? Um, and then in what sense is God going to crush Satan soon under the feet of the Roman believers? Um, you know, hasn't Satan already been defeated at the cross? Um, so in what sense is he still going to crush him? And in what sense is he going to do that um, under the feet of the Roman believers? Um, and so, um, so these are some of the questions. And then the other question is, is Paul really referring to Genesis 3.15 when he's uh, making this statement? Or are there some other Old Testament passages uh, that Paul might be alluding to instead? And so, um, like I said, scholars have um, presented surprisingly little analysis of this verse in some cases. Uh, for example, in the large um, commentary on the Old New Testament use of the Old Testament, this is a 1200 page volume, and it just sort of briefly brushes over this text. Um, it mentions that, uh, that Paul is likely referring to Genesis 3.15, and it doesn't really go into much discussion about it. It just sort of passes along and, uh, and moves on uh, to the next topic. Um, in Richard Longnecker's uh, commentary on Romans, uh, which is in the New International Greek Testament commentary series. This is a 1200 page volume on the book of Romans. Um, he says almost nothing about um, the content of this verse. He, he gives a lot of information about, you know, the text it came from, um, but he doesn't really talk about where it came from in the Old Testament. And all he's, basically all he says is one sentence saying that the God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. And he is speaking like this in order to build relations with them. Uh, so that's all he says. Um, in Stephen Rungi's commentary on Romans, uh, he just gives a few sentences. Um, he, he says, Paul describes the Lord as the God of peace and reminds the Romans that his peace will be seen or we'll see them through whatever trials may lie ahead. In Robert Mounce's commentary on Romans, in the New American Commentary, uh, and Joseph Fitzmyers' commentary, and William Hendrick Hendrickson's commentary, and C.K. Barrett's commentary on Romans, uh, they, they say virtually nothing about uh, the content of Romans 16 and, and where it came from in the Old Testament. And so it's almost like they spent so much time dealing with, you know, so many in-depth issues in the book of Romans that, um, you know, they're just sort of ready to be done. They need to get the book off to the publisher and they just don't want to spend much, much time uh, talking about this verse uh, at this point. Uh, now, there are some exceptions. Um, I sent you uh, some uh, 
excerpts from the commentary by Thomas Schreiner and by Frank Thielman. Uh, there are some that, uh, that do go into some detail uh, related to this verse. Um, but I mean, another one is, uh, it's not a commentary, but it's a, a very recent book and um, it's called Against the Darkness. It's a, a theology of angels, Satan and demons. So the whole purpose of the book is to talk about what the Bible says about Satan and angels and demons. And it doesn't even mention Romans 16, 20, even one time in the whole book. So, which I thought was a bit odd. Uh, so um, this does seem to be an underappreciated uh, verse in, in the book of Romans. Um, again, I think it's, you know, there's, there's so much else going on in Romans that you kind of forget that this is, is here at the end of the book. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is what Paul, what Old Testament passages Paul could be referring to uh, when he talks about crushing Satan. And also, um, you know, how this fits into the book of Romans as a whole. So the way we'll go through this um, today is we're going to use a method that I did not invent. Um, but there's a book that uh, G.K. Beale wrote. Um, it's called The Handbook on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. And uh, the book's not perfect, but it's a helpful guide. And uh, it, you know, there, there are going to be some things that we disagree with at some points. Um, but he gives a helpful step-by-step -step process for how to analyze uh, New Testament passages that are based in the Old Testament. And so, uh, so we're going to work through this nine-step method uh, today. Um, first, the first step is going to be to identify, first of all, the Old Testament reference. So, you know, you have a text in the New Testament. You're, you, you believe that it's, it's based in an Old Testament text. And uh, so you want to identify what that Old Testament text is. Um, you need to determine also whether you believe it's an, an actual quotation of the Old Testament text or whether Paul is just, or whether the New Testament writer is just alluding to the uh, Old Testament text. Step two, uh, we need to analyze the New Testament context where the Old Testament reference occurs. So there is a, uh, there's a broader New Testament context that we need to look at, which you know, in our case would be the book of Romans. Um, how does Paul's uh, thought process throughout the book of Romans um, uh, work out and, and sort of culminate with this, uh, with this reference to the crushing of Satan uh, under the feet of the believers? And then we'll look at the uh, immediate New Testament context as well. Uh, and so we'll look at this chapter of Romans and, and why Paul is using this here in this paragraph, in this part of the book. Uh, step three, then, is that we will analyze the Old Testament context of the original Old Testament quote. Again, we're looking at the, the context of the whole book that that quote comes from and the immediate context uh, that that Old Testament is found in. Uh, we'll look at um, some examples of using these Old Testament texts in early and late Judaism, which is sort of intertestamental literature. So we want to see if um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jewish thought was, was using, uh, Jewish literature was using this Old Testament text in a similar way to how the New Testament uses it. Then we want to compare the, the texts. So we'll look at how um, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew um, uh, treat the text, and then also how the, the Aramaic Targums uh, end up translating and interpreting the text. And so we'll see some, um, some differences uh, between those texts here. Number six, we'll analyze the author's textual use of the Old Testament. So we'll look at uh, whether Paul is relying on the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament passage, or if he's uh, using the Hebrew, or is Paul making up his own translation 
of the Hebrew text. And then uh, finally, we'll look at a few more things uh, where we're analyzing how um, in some interpretive matters. So first, we're, we'd be analyzing the interpretive or the hermeneutical use of the Old Testament. So do, do other New Testament writers uh, use and refer to the same Old Testament passage that Paul is referring to here? Uh, we'll look at the theological use of the Old Testament and what categories of systematic theology and what categories of biblical theology um, Paul would be referring to here. And then uh, we would analyze the rhetorical use of the Old Testament. So what is the author's purpose in using the Old Testament at this point uh, in the book? And so some of these overlap. And so uh, a lot of the content for what we're going to cover today is going to end up in points two and three above. Uh, but we'll, this is the, the general uh, path we're going to take uh, during this class period today. So first, we're going to start with identifying the, the Old Testament reference that Paul is referring to here. So most commentators, like I mentioned, agree that Genesis 3.15 is the text that's in view. Um, so let's look at the text here for Genesis 3.15, and I will share my display of that. So um, in Genesis 3.15, uh, it says, I will put hostility between you and the woman. Enmity would be another word that's used. And between your seed and her seed, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And so what I did here was I, I highlighted some of the key words as we see them in different uh, translations. So um, in the English translation, and, and so I put here the, the English translation of Romans 1620 here as well. So again, we're looking at this, he will strike your head as the connection between uh, Genesis 315 and Romans 1620. So with the word crush here, um, Paul uses the word soon tribo, which is a, a military term that's used for crushing your enemies. And so uh, Paul is saying that uh, uh, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Um, now in Genesis 3.15, uh, we have the same people involved. So uh, Genesis 3.15 here, and this is the Hebrew text of Genesis 3.15 in a translation, and this is the Greek text of Genesis 3.15 in a translation. Um, in Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to the serpent, who we would identify as Satan. Um, and, he, and so we have references to you. So the references in blue here are going to be references to the serpent, to Satan. So we have Satan here in this verse, the serpent. Um, and then we have the, the verb, what, what is going to happen to the serpent? He will strike the serpent. And so, um, so we have here the, the strike. Um, that we translated from this Hebrew word here is what Paul turns into soon tribo in Romans 16, 20. And then we also have a reference to the heel. And some people would say that this reference to the heel is possibly what Paul's thinking of when he's referring to the feet. The idea would be that as somebody would crush a serpent with their foot, and the serpent is going to bite their heel. Um, Paul is saying that in that sense, it's like the church of Rome, the Roman church is crushing the serpent with the heel. Um, and so then Paul uses the word feet. I don't think that's what's going on here uh, with why Paul is using feet. And we'll look at that here in a minute. One of the challenges that we're going to have with connecting Genesis 3.15 and Romans 16.20 is that the word for crush um, is, is handled a little differently in some places. And so in the King James Version and in the ESV, the English translation is bruise. Um, and so bruise doesn't really sound like crush. Crush seems more violent. Um, so that's one factor. The other factor is that the Septuagint 
does something really strange here. And um, it translates this word here. This is the Hebrew word shuf, which is where we get the word uh, crush or bruise. It translates that with tereo, which is the word keep or guard. So the Greek translation, or, or watch. So it says the Greek, the Greek translation would be he will watch or guard your head and you will watch or guard his heel. And so, um, so that's a little odd. Um, and I think what's, go what's, what's going on here is that in the Greek translation, um, it's saying that he is going to um, be watching and waiting for a chance to attack the head um, or something along those lines. Um, but the Greek translation of Genesis 3.15 is a bit enigmatic in that way. So Genesis 3.15 is, is, is a good option uh, for the Old Testament source here. Another option that gets presented is Psalm 91.13. Um, and so again, we have in Psalm 91.13, we have a, a promise that you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. So a couple of connections here between Psalm 91.13 and Romans 16.20 is this reference to the feet. Um, so you, you'll be trampled underfoot and uh, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And then you have a serpent in Psalm 91 and then you have Satan in Romans 16.20. Um, what's interesting is that in Psalm 91 in the Greek translation of the text, um, we have the word katapateo, um, but we don't have the word feet itself. Um, katapateo is, me, means to trample on. And so, um, so the idea is that you will trample on the serpent, but this, the word feet isn't really there. Um, so I don't think Psalm 9113 is the strongest connection here, um, but some people do connect it uh, because of the the crushing of serpents under your feet. Now, these the next two options kind of go together. It's Psalm 8.6 and Psalm 110.1. With Psalm 8.6, um, it says it's a messianic psalm, and it says you have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. And, um, and so obviously, under his feet, um, would be a direct connection to how the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Um, so the under the feet seems to be the, um, the connection here. And so let's look at these side by side. And uh, So here we've got, um, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under his feet. And so again, in the Greek translation, uh, it gives us uh, hupa, hupa kato, uh, tone, padon, autu, so under his feet, where in Romans 16, 20, uh, we have something similar, not exactly the same, but similar. It's under your feet. Um, so it uses a different, a slightly different preposition, which means the same thing. And um, it's using your feet instead of his feet. Um, so there is some similarity there. Um, Psalm 110.1 is the other um, option uh, for what Romans 16 might be referring to. And again, we have another reference to, um, to the feet in that he is going to make enemies your footstool. Now, Psalm 110.1 is I believe the most frequently quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. And so this is prominent in Paul's mind and in the gospel writer's minds um, and in the book of Hebrews especially. And so, um, so it's possible also that Psalm 110, one is in view here. So those are our options. Um, I think the two strongest options based on what we've seen so far are the uh, Genesis 3.15 um, and or Psalm 110.1. Um, 
would be the reference here. So um, I gave you some reading um, related to this. There's another uh, article that discusses this topic. And this is probably the one that discusses the topic most in depth, but this one disagrees with the idea that Genesis 3.15 is in view. Uh, this is an article by uh, Derek R. Brown, and it's called The God of Peace Will Shortly Crush Satan Under Your Feet. And he argues uh, that the key phrase in Romans 16.20 in relation to the Old Testament is the phrase, under your feet. And so based on that, uh, he says that Romans 16.20a is best interpreted in light of its allusion uh, to Psalm 110.1 as a reference to the subjugation of Satan and not as a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. So uh, Brown is arguing against the idea that Romans 16.20 um, is based on Genesis 3.15. Instead, he believes it's based on Psalm 110.1. So let's look at his arguments uh, that he uses against a reference to Genesis 3.15. First of all, he says that Paul's wording is not close to either the Hebrew or the Greek versions of Genesis 3.15. And we just looked at the different some of those differences. One of the words, one of the differences is with the key word for crush in Romans 16.20. And it is um, it's not the same word that's used in the Greek Old Testament. And um, and so that's one of the reasons uh, that, and, and there's no other, the structure of the verse is not quoting Genesis 3.15. And so uh, Brown's arguing that it's just not the same wording. So we shouldn't see a connection here. His second argument is related to the first argument. It's essentially the same argument. Um, Paul's verb choice does not indicate an allusion to Genesis 3. Uh, he argues that Paul's crush is more violent than the Hebrew word bruise. And so, uh, again, that's the same argument as, as argument one. I think he just wanted to have more arguments. So this is argument number two for him. Um, and then the third argument, which again is pretty much the same as number one, um, if Genesis 3.15 is shaping Paul's thought, one would probably expect to find the Greek term ha-office uh, for the serpent instead of ha satana, satanas for Satan. So because Paul is using the word Satan instead of the word serpent, um, Brown argues uh, it's probably not referring to Genesis 3.15. Um, again, that's like the same as verse one. The wording is different. His final argument is would, we would call his second argument probably, is that he says allusions to Genesis 3.15 are not common in the New Testament, and they are conspicuously absent in the undisputed letters of Paul. So um, he says Paul doesn't really refer to Genesis 3.15 anywhere else. Um, and so why would we expect him to be referring to Genesis 3.15 here? Now this argument does have um, some merit because as somebody who's spent a large portion of the last five years of my life studying Genesis 3.15. I, I kind of wish that Paul had quoted the verse more, um, but he didn't. And uh, But I think Genesis, the influence of Genesis 3.15 um, does demonstrate itself in Paul's theology. Um, the article I sent you guys by Thielman, or the, the excerpt from Thielman's commentary, um, again, he also disagrees with the Genesis 3.15 idea, and he says that the language in Romans 16.20 is closer to Psalms 8.6 and 1.10.1. And he says that's a combination that early Christians often used to describe Christ's victory over God's enemies. So, so these are his arguments. Um, and so let's, let's talk about these um, and, and see what what we think about these. Uh, so let's uh, go back to the other document. Oh, 
All right. So first of all, let's look at the words Paul uses and see if Brown's arguments are, are valid. Um, so Paul uses the word uh, soon tribo for, for crush here. And so he says the God of peace will crush Satan. And so Brown says that that's not the same word that's used in Genesis 3.15. The problem with this word that's used in Genesis 3.15, this word is the Hebrew word shuf. Um, so it's used here and here. Um, and it's the same word for um, the seed, the offspring of the woman is going to shuf the head of the serpent. And the serpent is going to shuf the heel of the offspring of the woman. Now, the problem is this word shuf is only used two other times in the whole Old Testament. And so we don't have a whole lot to work with when trying to determine what this word means. Uh, one example is in Job 9.17. In Job 9.17, uh, Job says, for he crushes me with a tempest. So there is a storm that is crushing Job. Um, other translations, the NASB goes with bruising. Um, the Net Bible goes with crushes. The Holman goes with he batters me. Uh, the King James says he breaks me. And so we've got some different um, translations here. When we think of the word bruise, it's a, the English word bruise, it's normally, um, we normally think of it as, you know, when you're hit with a blunt instrument, um, you, you have a colored, a colored place on your skin and that's a bruise. Um, that's not what the Hebrew word shuf is referring to. Um, we have no evidence that it's referring to that kind of a mark. We, we do know that in, you know, in the English from the King James Version um, from several centuries ago, um, there was the idea that when you were bruising somebody, you were crushing them. And so we do have evidence that a, a more violent, something more violent than just a bruising is in view here. And then I think some of the modern translations go with bruise because the King James originally went with, went with bruise. But you definitely want to think of a storm bruising somebody in that sense, uh, you know, causing a coloration of the skin because of a, a blunt attack. Um, and so, um, it, so this doesn't seem to really fit with bruise. The other uh, example of this word in the Old Testament is in Psalm 139. And Psalm 139 is a passage that talks about God's omniscience. And this verse doesn't really help us a whole lot. It's a little confusing why the word uh, shuf is used here. Um, it says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Well, this word cover here is, is this word here, which is shuf. And so, um, so the word shuf here is the same word that's used in Genesis 3.15. Um, now, again, this is poetic. And so we don't really know, um, you know, how literal he's being. But if we wanted to try to find a connection between um, the sense of this word in these verses, I think what we do have is um, in each of those cases, there is some object that is moving with force against another object. Um, so in Job, you have a storm that's, that's, that's moving with force against Job. In Psalm 139, you have darkness that is sort of moving against me to cover me. So it, it's sort of an opposition to me to cover me. And then in Genesis 3.15, you could say that um, the, the serpent and the seed of the woman are going to be uh, violently moving against each other. And so I think that's, uh, that's the idea of what's going on in Genesis 3.15. So when we're translating Genesis 3.15 in English, then I would not go with bruise. I would go with something more like what the Net Bible does with attack or what the Holman Bible does with strike. Um, so Brown's argument that um, bruise 
isn't as strong of a word as Paul's crush, I don't think that's a great argument because bruise really isn't what, what Genesis was saying. What Genesis is saying is something more like striking or attacking. And if you're going to strike or attack a serpent, that's going to be a, a crushing. Now, if the serpent is going to attack a human, the serpent's not going to be crushing the human. Uh, he's going to be attacking the human. Um, but it's not, we wouldn't call it a crushing. Um, so I think it is legitimate, though, to say that because when a human attacks a serpent, um, that that would look like crushing, um, that a, an appropriate translation of this would be crush. Um, so, um, so I think that Paul is uh, using a legitimate translation in Romans 16, 20. And what I would argue is that Paul is probably... This is just my own idea of what Paul is doing here. It's, uh, it could be wrong. Um, but I think what Paul is doing is he's aware that he's aware of what the Hebrew word is. He's also aware of what the Septuagint says, which it says tereo, which is keep or watch. And he knows that's not the best translation of the verse. And so I think what Paul's doing is he's taking the best translate, the best Greek word that he knows of to translate what he thinks is going on in Genesis 3.15, which is soon tribo. And so I think what Paul is doing is he's coming up with his own Greek translation of, uh, of the Hebrew text because the Septuagint is inadequate in this verse. So, so that takes care of one of Brown's arguments. Um, the other, another one of, uh, Brown's arguments was that uh, Paul would have used the word uh, serpent instead of Satan in this passage um, if he's referring to Genesis 3.15. I think that's it's not a great argument. Um, so, um, and I think Paul does something similar here in 2 Corinthians. So if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul, again, is talking about false teachers. Remember what's going on in Romans 16, uh, Paul's warning against false teachers. Um, so in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So we have this reference to uh, the serpent. Now, then Paul explains the problems of false teachers, and in the same context, just a little while later, he is referring to these such men are false apostles, they're deceitful workmen, they're disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And so I think both of these references, the serpent earlier in the verse and Satan at this point in the verse, are referring back to Genesis 3. So um, in Genesis 3, it, it's likely that Satan is disguising himself as an angel of light. And then in Genesis 3, it's likely that what's going on is uh, the serpent is deceiving Eve by his cunning. And so uh, Paul is connecting the serpent in Genesis 3 here, who deceived Eve, with Satan, who later a few verses later is disguising himself as an angel of light so paul clearly here understands certain the serpent and satan to be the same person uh and so quibbling here over the fact that he says satan instead of the serpent uh it really is is not a great uh argument for brown to be making now brown's other argument um is that he he says that Paul doesn't really refer to Genesis 3.15 anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, however, I would argue again that Genesis 3.15 does show up in Paul's theology, um, even though he doesn't necessarily quote Genesis 3.15. Um, Genesis 3.15 is, is, of course, the seed promise. It's a promise of offspring. Um, it, Paul, in numerous cases, in several different letters, uh, refers to the offspring of Abraham. Uh, in the book of Romans, in chapter 4, he refers a number of times to the offspring of Abraham. 
in 2 Corinthians 11, he also refers to the offspring of Abraham in Galatians 3. He has a number of verses that talk about Jesus uh, as uh, the expected offspring. Um, he also refers to the offspring of David. So Paul definitely understands that the Old Testament gave the expectation of offspring that was going to come and, uh, and defeat the serpent and bring salvation. Um, and Paul is certainly aware that Genesis 3.15 is the initial seed promise. And so, um, though he does not declare the Genesis 3.15, he does not cite Genesis 3.15 in particular. Paul does, though, um, d demonstrate a clear dependence on Psalm 110. We know in, there are a number, of, a number of cases where Psalm, where he's quoting Psalm 110, for example, Ephesians 120. It says um, that he, he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And so we see here that um, Paul understands Jesus currently to be at the right hand of God. Um, and then also Colossians chapter three, verse one. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So, um, so Paul definitely is referring to Psalm 110, one here again with Jesus being at the right hand of God. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, it says that he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So again, a, a reference to perhaps Psalm 8, but also um, his enemies being under his feet uh, would refer to Psalm 110. So Psalm 110 is prominent in Paul's writing. What's interesting, though, is that Psalm 110 uh, seems to be, uh, seems to describe a direct fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. So we're going to look at Psalm 1, a couple of elements of Psalm 110 in comparison to Genesis 3.15. And so what I'm going to say, what I'm going to argue is that Paul is referring to both Psalm or Genesis 3.15 and Psalm 110 in Romans 16.20. And the, the verses fit together really well um, because what was promised in Genesis 3.15 is also spoken of in Psalm 10, Psalm 110.1. So Psalm 110.1 is a messianic psalm. Um, Genesis 3.15 is a messianic promise. And a couple of notes here. Um, so it says, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So we have this word enemies here. The word enemies is the word, is the Hebrew word here, which is oyev. Um, so the Hebrew word for enemies is oyev. And then in Genesis 3.15, we have this Hebrew word enmity. So um, enmity is the state of being an enemy with someone else. Now the word enmity here is the same root word for enemies. It's uh, eva. And so it uses the same, at the same root word. Uh, one of them is the state of being enemies, and the other one is uh, the actual term for enemies. So both references are referring to enemies um, in a messianic context. And they're both referring to um, the enemies of the Messiah being defeated. So that's one connection uh, between uh, these two Psalms. Now, what we or between Psalm 110 and Genesis 3:15. Now, what we see in a few verses later in Psalm 110:6 is something else that's very interesting in this messianic psalm. It says, "He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth." So, in this messianic psalms, in this messianic psalm. Uh, the Messiah is going to shatter chiefs. Now, shattering chiefs sounds a little odd. In Hebrew, the, the word for shatter is machas, um, and the word for, for chiefs here is rosh. Now, what's interesting is that this word rosh here is the same Hebrew word for the word head. Um, so a, a literal rosh 
is a head on your body. It's, and, and so then the word chief came about because a person who is the head of a group is a chief, is he's in charge. And so there's a metaphorical use of Roche. Now for, for, I don't, for some reason, the ESV decided to go with chiefs here. The NASB went with chiefs. Um, the Holman went with leaders. The Net Bible, I think, does the right thing, and it goes with heads. And it says he shatters their heads over the vast battlefield. To me, it makes more sense to say that a head is going to be shattered um, than that a chief is going to be shattered. Now, in this messianic psalm, where the Messiah is going to be defeating his enemies, and he is going to shatter their heads, it seems quite clear that this is a reference, this is a reference to how Genesis 3.15 is going to be fulfilled with the fact that he will bruise, he will crush the head of his enemy, uh, the serpent. Now, in support of this translation of Rosh as head, we can go to another Messianic Psalm, which is Psalm 68. Now, Paul quotes Psalm 68 in Ephesians chapter 4. Psalm 68 is a psalm about uh, the Messiah's victory over his enemies. And Paul says in Ephesians 4 um, that, um, that when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. And that's what happens earlier in Psalm 68. But what's interesting is in Psalm 68, 21, it says here, God will strike the heads of his enemies. And we have the same two words here, makats, that's the same word here as makats in Psalm 110. And then we have the word heads here, rosh, which is the same word for chiefs here. And so now what all the translations do in Psalm 68, though, is they translate all of these as heads, 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 heads. Why are they doing that in Psalm 68? and not in Psalm 110. Well, in Psalm 68, we've got um, this phrase that sort of explains the previous phrase. It says, he's going to shatter their heads, the hairy crown of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. So you have to translate this as heads. What I would argue though, is that uh, Psalm 110 should have done the same thing, and they should have recognized that this connection of shattering heads uh, in Psalm 68, in a messianic psalm, talking about the Messiah's victory over his enemies, um, would use the same words here in Psalm 110.6. So I would say that both of these psalms then are demonstrating fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And these psalms support the idea of Paul's use of crush in Romans 16.20. Any questions about this? Because I just went through a lot of stuff, I think. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, just processing and I, I never made that connection before, but it's helpful. So I think we're good. Okay. I need to take a breath too. <laughs> so, all right. So, so based on all this information, I think that Paul in Romans 16, 20, is referring to Genesis 3.15 and Psalm 110.1. Um, we're not limited to the idea that Paul can only refer to one Old Testament text at a time. We're not limited to the idea that um, you have to have the exact precise word uh, for Paul to be referring to the same concept. Uh, for example, almost all theologians would agree that the kingdom of God is a, um, is a prominent biblical theological concept. Uh, that's where uh, the, the direction of scripture is going, uh, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And the New Testament makes that abundantly clear with the term kingdom of God. Now, all those same theologians would agree that the Old Testament was looking forward to the fulfillment of that kingdom of God, but it doesn't use that phrase kingdom of God I don't think ever in the same tense in the same sense that the New Testament does. So it's not using the exact same words, but it's absolutely agreeing to the exact 
same concept um, of the kingdom of God. And so uh, when we're doing word studies, when we're looking at the meaning of words and, and, and intertextuality, we're not tied just to an, an exact precise word. Um, we, we do have some flexibility, particularly if the concept seems to be uh, very strongly presented. So um, fate in the article I sent you said, it's clear then that there is a conglomeration or a catena of ideas that Paul is drawing from, not a singular one. And so if you said, you know, we're saved by faith, you could be referring to a, a numerous different New Testament texts. We don't have to just pick one. Um, we know that there is a conglomeration of ideas behind this, and there is a conglomeration of Old Testament ideas that support that as well. Uh, Genesis 3.15 seems to be in the backdrop of the other texts suggested as Paul's source text as well. And uh, Schreiner also says the two aren't mutually exclusive. In fact, Psalm 110.1 itself alludes to Genesis 3.15. So, um, so we made it through step one of um, Beale's uh, steps. And uh, so we need to go a little faster with the rest of the steps. Step two will take, will take some time. And the other steps, we have some flexibility with, um, with how much detail we go into. Um, so we'll start looking at um, number two. I will analyze the New Testament context where the Old Testament reference occurs. And so we'll look at the broad uh, New Testament context in the book of Romans. And so let's go ahead and uh, look at Romans chapter one. As I'm sure has been discussed at length in this class, uh, the book of Romans, is uh, largely a presentation of the gospel. And so Paul introduces the letter and he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, the first thing he says about this gospel is that this is a gospel that was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So, the very first thing Paul says about the gospel is that this was promised beforehand through his prophets in the scriptures. So we would expect then that what Paul is going to be showing us in this, in this book of Romans is how this gospel was promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures. So when Paul is using the Old Testament in Romans, you would expect this to be a, a support for what the gospel of God is. Now, this is a gospel concerning his son, and the key part of this, uh, the fact that the gospel is concerning his son, is that his son was descended from David according to the flesh. So, that was what the Old Testament was expecting. It was expecting a descendant of David. What's interesting, of course, is that in this verse, it's not using a verb, descended, it's using a verb that means he was born, or he was generated. He was generated from the seed of David, from the offspring of David. So this is an offspring reference. This isn't just merely saying this is born. Paul's going back to Old Testament offspring language to say, this is where Jesus came from. He was descended from David. Uh, he was of the seed of David. So Paul is, is leaning on seed promises, on, on promises of offspring in his present in his presentation of the gospel so he begins the gospel saying the old testament was promising this gospel and i'm going to explain to you what this gospel is and so he works through each chapter of romans uh talking about uh the sin problem justification by faith how the how the sin problem is solved and how we can have new life through the spirit and then finally when he gets to the end of the letter Paul's conclusion to the letter after the promise that we're looking at is in verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. So he goes back and he says, we're, this is, this is uh, according to my gospel. This is what I've been proclaiming to you. What does that mean? Well, this is according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but it has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. So at the beginning and the end of Romans, Paul is saying, 
this gospel that I'm presenting to you is the same gospel that has been presented in the prophets and in the writings. And I am presenting to you and showing you how that gospel is fulfilled and how that's working itself out. And so he works systematically through each of the, the elements of soteriology and salvation, how we come to faith and how uh, we can live in Christ and in the spirit in the church and how we can interact well with other people. And the final thing that Paul presents as a part of this gospel that was presented in the Old Testament is that Satan, the serpent, from the beginning will be defeated. So part, so a, the critical part of Paul's good news, uh, a, the critical conclusion uh, to Paul's good news is just a few verses earlier, and that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. And so that shows us a little bit of how this promise of good news of Satan's defeat fits in with the entirety of the presentation of the gospel in the book of Romans. And, uh, and so I think that's helpful to see how that fits in, in the big picture. We also have several other victory statements that come up throughout the book of Romans. Um, you know, they don't necessarily use the same words here, uh, but we have several sort of significant exp expressions of victory uh, throughout the book. Uh, for example, in Romans chapter five, uh, verse 20. Um, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign uh, through righteousness leading to eternal life. So there's a, a victory statement. Another one is in Romans 7, 24. Wretched man, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So there's this victory statement here. Uh, the next chapter, Romans 8, uh, 37. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, a number of victory statements. And then in Romans 12, 21, he tells us, don't be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with good. So we need to have victory over the evil and that's what paul says right before romans 16 20 i want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil and when paul thinks of what is evil he thinks of satan and satan being crushed joel do you want to take a break now great that works um, How long? Good. Let's just plan to come back. We usually do about five minutes. So we'll just come back about, I don't know, uh, seven, eight minutes after the hour and pick up after that. So right. great. Thanks. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, let's just be back in about five minutes and we'll continue on from there. All right. Um, so a few things I want to make sure I have communicated to you guys. One, if you have further questions about the remaining requirements of the course, feel free to message with me. It's pretty standard. Uh, you have the standard number of page expectations. Actually, the homework this time around has had a ton of pages in it already. So you're going to get pretty far if you kept up with a homework assignment. It's already going to get a lot of that, that page count up for you. So there's that. Um, and then the second thing is, as far as a paper, you know, it's kind of the sky's the limit, or it's just really broad in terms of what interests you and what you want to pursue, we want it to be something obviously connected to Romans. Um, but you could you could do a, a theology direction, you could do an intertextuality direction, you could take a particular passage and do exegesis. I mean, I really want to be very broad with it. That's the nature of this kind of. So take something that interests you. Take something you're going to be able to turn around and use in another context. Um, so that. And then, um, oh, one other comment. I did also put a couple of materials, new materials into the Google Classroom. I'll drop the links here if it just saves you a step. It's nothing good. Uh, anyway, just put in the uh, the annotated PDF, 
that I use for Romans, a lot of the notes in there are zoomed in like really, really far and written in between the words. So if you just see some fuzz between the words, you zoom in, that's, that's the way I write my notes in there. And then um, you'll also find my lecture notes. They're not very well edited. Some of it will make sense, but maybe something could be useful. That's it. Um, so if you have further questions, just message me and we'll stay in touch that way. Uh, let's go. I've been enjoying this content and want to make sure that we, we give you plenty of time. So. All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. All right, so we'll pick up where we left off. Um, so we're looking at the broad New Testament context and um, we looked at other victory statements in Romans briefly. And so now I want, it, it was interesting to me that Paul uses this term, uh, God of peace. And uh, so it's interesting to see how the word, how prominent the concept of peace is in the book of Romans. Uh, Paul uses the word peace nine times. And uh, we're not going to go into depth on these, but uh, Paul uses it several times, grace to you in peace, glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The way of peace have they not known. Uh, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. The kingdom of joy, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy. Uh, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Uh, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. May the God of peace be with you all. And then, of course, our text, uh, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. So why does Paul keep talking about the God of peace? Why does he refer to him this way? There's an interesting article um, by a guy named Mark Reasoner. Um, it's called Paul's Letter Against the Roman Gods. It's actually a chapter in a, a book. Um, and he, he looks at some of the Roman ideas of um, gods, some of their, the virtues um, from pol Roman political and social life. And, um, and so Reasoner argues that um, since Paul's purpose is to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome, um, when this purpose is considered in light of the political and religious landscape in Rome, when he considers all the political and religious elements of Roman society, Paul's emphasis on faith and hope and peace and salvation found in the letter to the Romans uh, begin to appear in a new light. And so um, he said that uh, Roman political life deifies uh, some basic virtues such as faith and justice and peace and safety and social harmony. Uh, so those were all the things that the Roman Empire valued. And it was Roman victory that enables all of these. Um, so this was uh, a, during a time period, which uh, is referred to as the, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And uh, so Rome valued peace and peace came through uh, their Roman military victory. So a reasoner presents this chart. It, it's sort of the, the main thing I wanna sh say, show here is that uh, the Roman idea was that Victoria, victory at the bottom, was the source for all of these other virtues. We can't have you know, faith and peace and justice unless we have victory. So Roman victory sort of starts it all. And then, um, then you end up with uh, salvation and um, peace and justice and concord and we can all get along and uh, we can all get along well in society. So what Reasoner argues is that uh, Paul takes these Roman virtues, and he and he uses them, uh, but he says that uh, these virtues are not based in um, Roman victory. Instead, they're based on uh, grace, and so he uh, and so he presents this an alternative chart. You all my sharing stuff. Is that supposed to happen? I think somehow it got stuck. Uh, it was seemed like it was frozen on Logos, but. Oh, 
Cool. Okay. We've got you now. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, so this is the um, this is Reasoner's chart showing uh, the different um, these key themes uh, from Roman society. So it all begins with victory at the bottom, and then it flows up into and results in these other aspects. Um, what Reasoner does is he, is he says Paul's using these same concepts in the book of Romans, but he's saying that they start not with Roman victory, they start with the grace of Christ. So grace turns into hope, which produces faith, which produces justification, and which produces the possibility for peace and salvation and uh, concord and victory. And so, um, so Paul is taking Roman virtues and he's He's turning them around um, and, and, and basing them in a, in a godly worldview. Um, so whereas the Roman idea is that the Roman victory brings peace, it is, in Paul's view, it is the grace of Christ which brings peace and also victory and concord and everything else uh, that we see in, in, the Rome, in, the, in this book of Romans. Um, so what's interesting then is that when Paul talks about um, trampling um, or crushing Satan under the feet of the Roman church, um, fate says, uh, moreover, the idea of trampling underfoot would have had a special relevance in the Roman context in light of the serpent imagery in Roman triumphs and on coins of the victor standing on the neck of the defeated with an inscription like under the yoke of Rome. And the winged Pax, which was a, a Roman god, holding a staff over a strewn snake was common imperial propaganda. So, for example, these coins are from about AD 29 to AD 32. And you have the idea of this, uh, this Roman god or uh, of Caesar um, standing on top of his enemies in victory and his his enemy here is the world. Um, he, is, um, he has victory over his enemies. And so this was a common view, is that the Romans um, were going to be crushing their enemies. Their enemies were going to be under their feet in victory. And so what Paul turns this around and he says that the God of peace, not Roman Pax Romana, not the peace that comes from uh, Roman society, but it's the, the God of peace, who will be crushing Satan under, uh, under your feet. And so I, I thought that was an interesting and helpful um, background to why Paul might be using this, this terminology here. So then um, another interesting question is that this is Paul's first reference to Satan in the book of Romans. And so the question then is, why hasn't Paul talked at all at this point about Satan? The only thing we, the, the closest we get to Paul referring to Satan in the book of Romans is in Romans chapter eight, when Paul is referring to how principalities and powers can't separate us from uh, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so it's, it's interesting that here at the end of the letter is the first time uh, Paul mentions Satan in this letter. Now, this is a letter where Paul goes in depth um, more than in any other letter. Uh, he goes more in depth on sin and how sin affects humanity. And he goes that whole time without mentioning Satan's influence at all. Whereas in other letters, um, Paul does focus on um, Satan's influence among lost humanity. Um, so, with um, one thing that fate says is that the introduction of Satan here at the end of the letter seems to, to strike the reader as a bit foreign. And um, I couldn't find very many people who talked about why Paul doesn't really talk about Satan and Romans up to this point, um, because he does talk about Satan prominently in his other letters and his role in the world. Um, but one, one writer who, who does mention this is uh, Adolf Schlatter. Most people haven't read much by Adolf Schlatter, 
Um, but he was a, a conservative German theologian from the early 20th century. And, uh, and he talked about this, and I want to show you his, his quote. So I'll present that here. So he says, the fact is instructive, however, that Paul did not elaborate on sin's relation to Satan in the didactic portions in Romans. So when Paul's talking about sin and justification and the human problem and our struggle with the flesh, um, Paul doesn't talk about Satan, either in his treatment of the pagan's guilt or when discussing the powerlessness of the flesh. By this, he proved that he rejected intellectualism in his thought if he had wanted to reveal sin in its full extent, or even had sought to explain its origin, he would also have spoken of transcendent evil and its influence on the sinful condition of mankind. So what Schlatter is suggesting here is that Paul's not trying to give the intellectual foundation for sin, which for him would be that Satan's behind it and to, to some degree. Um, instead, Paul, in his treatment of sin, desires solely to affect repentance and faith by which man rejects his evil will and submits to the righteousness of God. So because there is an extent in salvation to where it really just doesn't matter what Satan's influence is in sin and in human sin, what matters is that every individual person um, is sinful, and their problem is not that they, uh, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with Satan. It has to do with the fact that they have offended a holy and righteous God, and they don't have righteousness. Um, and so what man needs to do is not anything in relation to Satan. Um, it is to repent and exercise faith by which man rejects his evil will and submits to the righteousness of God. Thus, Paul's profound apprehension of the condition manifest in his own consciousness does not occasion the exploration of mysteries resulting from the relation of mankind to the supernatural spirit world. He doesn't even get into the whole spirit world. He does in Ephesians and some other letters. Paul thought of Satan primarily when evil took place in Christendom. Most of Paul's warnings in the New Testament about Satan are with Satan's influence on believers and Satan's temptations of believers. Um, Paul thought of Satan particularly when evil took place in Christendom. He conceived of him as the adversary of Christ who seeks to destroy his work. Thus, he did not call attention to the seduction of the first man by Satan when Adam is depicted as the initiator of sin for mankind. So again, in Romans 5, Paul blames Adam. He puts the blame of sin on Adam. He doesn't blame it on the serpent. He doesn't even blame it on the person that the serpent tempted, which was Eve. He blames it on Adam. Uh, but rather, when the proud community needs to realize that it stands in danger of falling. So Paul warns believers about Satan when he believes they're in danger of falling. That Satan is the God of this world is said not when the pagan needs to realize why he must turn believingly to Christ, but when Gnostic arrogance despises the gospel. When obstacle upon obstacle mounts up against his work, he speaks of the invisible enemy. And so that's why numerous times when Paul is talking about false teachers, like we looked at in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul connects Satan's work with the work of people who present false gospels. And, and so that's um, the most helpful explanation I've found of why Paul doesn't talk about Satan at all in the book of Romans until <clears throat> this point, right at the end of the book. All right, so then, <clears throat> so now we're going to look at, <clears throat> so that's sort of a little bit about the broad context of Romans. And we're going to look now at the immediate context of what's going on in chapter 16 of Romans um, to help us understand the connections Paul's making here. So uh, let me do this. All right, so in the immediate New Testament context, of course, Paul's giving greetings at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> he gives his warning against false teachers and then the promise of Satan's defeat. So <clears throat> what is it 
that causes Paul to think about Satan <clears throat> in the context of these false teachers. Um, there are a few different views of how Paul gets to this, st this statement about Satan. He gives them the warning about false teachers, <clears throat> and then he says, um, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. <clears throat> One idea is that people, some people would argue that the promise about crushing Satan under their feet is not connected at all <clears throat> to the warning against false teachers. And so they would say it's just sort of a general promise. Um, so they would say there's no connection between these two. They would say that the Roman Empire is sort of like Satan. And, <clears throat> um, and so then God's going to help them defeat their enemies. Um, another variation of that is that this is just a general promise um, that God's going to defeat Satan in the end. It's a promise that gives hope. It doesn't really have anything to do with the false teachers, but it, it, it's just a promise that God's going to end up having victory over the serpent. Um, another view is that uh, Paul is very closely connecting um, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 19, <clears throat> with this promise about Satan and how Satan's going to be crushed. And so the idea here is that <clears throat> false teachers are seen to be uh, servants of Satan <clears throat> in this way. Um, and then a fourth view is that this is a general eschatological promise. So this is referring to, you know, generally in the end, um, God's going to defeat Satan, but Paul was particularly thinking of this because he had just talked about false teachers. Um, so I think that either that third or the fourth one is the most likely that um, Paul talks about false teachers. And when he talks about false teachers, he realizes uh, that what's going on with these false teachers um, is satanic opposition uh, to the gospel. And so that leads him to a promise that says there, there's all this opposition to the gospel but don't worry, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Uh, and then you won't have to worry about uh, those, that false teaching anymore. Um, again, we'll look at 2 Corinthians 11 again briefly, um, but we have the same concept going on here in 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul connects the false teachers with the with satanic activity. So when you look at what, uh, Romans 16 compared to 2 Corinthians 11, we have a warning here in verse 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, we have people who are coming and proclaiming another Jesus than the one we proclaimed or receiving a different spirit than the one you received or accepting a different gospel. Um, so we have a similar warning about people doing similar things. Uh, we have false teachers here. And then what happens in Romans 16, 18 is that Paul says that what they're doing is that by their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So their methodology is using smooth talk and flattery <clears throat> to deceive the hearts of the naive. Well, this is very similar to what the serpent did with Eve, which Paul references in 2 Corinthians 3. As the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led, aw led astray from a sincere and <clears throat> pure devotion to Christ. So we have a deceiving going on in both places. So here we have, um, they deceive the hearts of the naive, and Satan deceived um, Eve, who was naive, and he used smooth talk and flattery. And so we have the same kind of concept going on here. And then Paul explains in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And then he gives a statement about what's going to happen to these people. They're going to be punished. Their end will correspond to their deeds. 
So he connects these false teachers with Satan and he says, don't worry, these people will be punished. And what he tells the Romans in 1620 is, don't worry, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So um, it's the same concept uh, of what, what's going on in each place is the same concept. And so I think Paul is very much connecting um, these false teachers and saying that what they're doing is satanic activity in uh, presenting false gospels. All right, so that's a little bit of contextual analysis, um, looking at uh, this part of Paul's gospel. And so um, to the Romans, and then let's see where we're at with uh, Beale's nine step method. So we've completed points one and two, and um, we're gonna move quickly through the through the rest of these. So, like I said at the beginning, some of these overlap to some degree. And so we've already covered some things that we're gonna to need to cover in, in later points. So analyzing the Old Testament context, both broad and immediate. Um, so what we wanna do here is look at the book of Genesis and look at the Old Testament. We're not gonna have time to go into this in detail. I did this in the session I did last summer. So if you're interested in looking at Genesis 3.15 throughout the Old Testament, feel free to go back and, and watch that video. Um, but the, the concepts in Genesis 3.15 are, are prominent as um, foundational promises for the Old Testament. So the seed promise in Genesis 3.15 um, is developed by the seed promise to Abraham. Um, and the seed promises to Abraham are the promises through which the rest of the Bible is developed. Um, so it's the seed of Abraham um, that God is working through and, um, and working to fulfill his promises. And so Genesis 3.15 is a foundational text in the Old Testament. Um, so then we wanna survey how that Old Testament text was used in early and late Judaism. Now, so what we would look at here is some texts from the pseudepigrapha, the, um, some of the intertestamental writings. And um, we're not gonna have time to look into this um, in an in-depth way, but we'll just look at some of these examples and see how they, how they connect with, um, with Genesis 3.15. So let's go here. So there's a, a book called the Book of Jubilees. And uh, there's an expectation in this book um, that it's talking about the enemies of God's people. So if you go up to uh, verse 23 here, it's talking about the enemies of God's people who um, are wicked and they do more evil than all the children of men. They use violence against Israel. So we have God's enemies here and they're going to be destroyed. So uh, God's going to deliver his people. And then later on, we see that all their days uh, after the enemies are defeated, all their days, they shall uh, complete and live in peace and enjoy. And there shall be no Satan nor any evil destroyer for all their days shall be days of blessing and healing. Um, and at that time, the Lord will heal his servants and they shall rise up and see great peace and drive out their adversaries. So there's this expectation here that uh, Satan is going to be destroyed. Satan's going to be no more. And so uh, the idea here is that Paul is aware of these um, writings and he's aware of this expectation that, um, that Satan's going to be destroyed and there won't be any destroyer anymore. Um, in the testimony of Moses. Um, the assumption of Moses is another writing uh, from the intertestamental period. Um, people are expecting after a time of suffering up here by evil men, um, they're expecting the kingdom to come. Then his kingdom shall appear throughout all his creation. And then Satan shall be no more and sorrow shall depart with him. 
Uh, so again, an expectation that Satan is going to be destroyed. Um, and this is from the Testament of Levi. Um, and look at 18, 12, there are these promises about, again, the coming kingdom that God is going to bring. And in Beliar, Beliar was known to be a, a demon, uh, a very powerful demon. And it's saying that this, this demon, Beliar, shall be bound by him. And he shall give power to his children. God will give power to his children to tread upon the evil spirits. Now, again, that's, that's really interesting um, because um, that's similar to uh, Psalm 91, where, his, um, where people are able to tread upon snakes. Um, and this does seem really close to what Jesus says um, when he commissions the 12 and he gives them the authority over here in Luke chapter 10. He gives them the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Uh, so these concepts were expected in the intertestamental literature, and Jesus uh, it seems to be you know, aware of them as well. Of course, they're all based in the Old Testament. So, um, And then a few more references as well. All the spirits of deceit shall be given to be trodden underfoot, and men shall rule over wicked spirits. So again, the subjugation of evil spiritual powers and uh, the trotting underfoot of these of these beings. So, with intertestamental literature, you know, obviously it's not scripture. Um, so, you know, we're not we're not bound to it as authoritative, but it does show how the Jewish people um, interpreted the Old Testament and uh, how. Um, and how that thought, how those thought processes develop uh, over time. The next step in the process is to compare the Old Testament texts and, and look at the differences. And we did a little bit of this before, um, but we also want to look at the what the Targums say, the Aramaic Targums, because they do something interesting with Genesis 3.15. So if you if you if you go back and look at Genesis 3.15, um, and you look at the Hebrew text, and then you have the, the Greek text. Um, you have, uh, again, the key difference here is that the Greek uses watch or guard instead of the Hebrew strike. Now, what the Targums do, there, there are three main Targums on the book of Genesis. Um, and the Targums, they do translation, but they also add some interesting uh, paraphrasing and sort of midrash uh, along the way. So there's, there's consistency in, in these gray parts here uh, where it's highlighted. I will I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your sons and her sons. Now what Neophyte does is he says, and it will come about that when her sons observe the law and do the commandments, they will aim at you and smite you on your head and kill you. But when they forsake the commandments of the law, you will aim and bite him on his heel and make him ill. So this is a very interpretive uh, translation of Genesis 3.15. For her sons, the sons of, so the seed of the woman, however, there will be a remedy. So you're going to strike, you're going to bite the heel of the seed of the woman, but there will be a remedy. But for you, O serpent, there will not be a remedy. So the serpent is going to be destroyed by this blow, uh, since they are to make appeasement in the end in the days of King Messiah. Uh, so Targum Neophyte um, demonstrates that there is a very clear messianic expectation in Genesis 3.15. Uh, Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, um, again, this first part of the verse is, is very similar. Um, and it talks about the obedience of the children of the woman. Um, so it's identifying the seed of the woman as people who keep the law. Um, they're going to strike you on the head. So this is demonstrating here that the children of the seed of the woman, so the seed of the woman, a collective group of people, they're going to take aim and strike the serpent on the head. So when we have in Romans 16, 20, the collective group, the church, crushing the 
crushing Satan. Uh, this is the same idea that the Targums are presenting, is that there's a collective group, uh, the offspring of the woman, who is going to strike you on the head. But they also realize that there is an individual offspring of the woman, King Messiah, who's going to come, and, and he's going to make peace. Targum Onkelos is a little different. Um, it says it will remember what you did to it in ancient time, and you will sustain your hatred for it to the end of time. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing with this, um, but uh, it's it's different. So, um, so that's a little bit of a comparison of of these different texts in in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Targums. So then we want to take a look at the author's uh, textual use of the Old Testament. So. We want to see what Paul's doing. And again, we talked about this a little bit earlier in relation to um, the translation of the verse. Um, one question that comes up is, does Paul typically rely on a certain text when he is translating? Um, does he typically depend on the Septuagint, or does he typically depend on the Hebrew, or is he translating it or doing something different? Um, one helpful article is in the dictionary of Paul's letters. And I'll show you uh, what this does. So this is an article by Moises Silva, again, in the dictionary of Paul and his letters. And it's in his article on the Old Testament um, in Paul. So it's the title of the article is Old Testament in Paul. And he breaks down all of the references that uh, all the citations Paul has of the Old Testament, and he analyzes which text they come from <clears throat> and whether he's using the Septuagint or the Hebrew. The MT is the Hebrew. So there are some situations where the, the Hebrew text matches exactly with the Septuagint, and Paul is quoting the Septuagint, which of course Paul would be quoting verbatim in Greek. <clears throat> There are some, and so, uh, uh, so Silva lists 46 of those, I believe, 42 of those. Um, then there are some examples where Paul is quoting the Hebrew text, um, but the Hebrew text does not match the Septuagint. So, and then he lists several occasions where this is the case. And then he lists several instances where Paul is matching the Septuagint, but not matching the Hebrew. Um, and then there's some where he seems to be quoting the Old Testament, but it doesn't really match the, the, the Septuagint, and it doesn't really match the Hebrew either. And so we've got a number of those examples. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that Silva does not list Romans 16, 20 as, as one of his um, options here, which he should have. Um, but he didn't. Um, so I think that's interesting to look through. But again, I think what's going on here as, as we look at the texts is that Paul is not quoting uh, the Old Testament. I believe what he's doing is, um, I think he's translating, he's giving an approved translation of the Hebrew text because the Greek translation <clears throat> just isn't good enough. <clears throat> so, um, so that's why Paul goes with crush <clears throat> instead of bruise or some other word. All right, so then we move on to uh, point seven, which in um, Beale's method is we want to analyze other places the New Testament um, uses the same Old Testament text. So we're looking at Genesis 3.15, and we're wanting to see if there are other places in the New Testament where the text is used in a similar way. And I think there are. So um, Hebrews 2.14, for example. I don't want. Uh, Hebrews 2.14, for example, uh, says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. 
So, um, so what we have here is that in Hebrews, um, one writer calls this a, a midrash on Genesis 3.15. So Hebrews is interpreting Genesis 3.15 in light of the work of Christ <clears throat> against the um, against the devil. So what's happened, a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 is that through death, he is going to destroy the devil who has the power of death, which is saying the same thing as what Romans 16.20 is saying, um, that Satan will be crushed. Um, so that same concept is used in a similar way to how Paul uses it <clears throat> in Romans 16, 20. Again, in John, in 1 John chapter 3, this is a, uh, let's go to this one. This is another passage where the same idea shows up. <clears throat> so whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, so again, this is a, a clear statement that there's an expectation all along throughout the Bible that the devil needs to be destroyed. And the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And so, and so this theme does come up. This does seem to be an allusion to Genesis 3.15. Again, not using the exact same words, um, but this is the same concept that Genesis 3.15 is expecting, um, is that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come to destroy the works of the devil. And of course, what happens in the next verse is we end up with this, this reference to God's seed. Um, and then we have two different kinds of people. We have children of God and children of the devil. So based on this terminology, it seems impossible to deny that John has in mind Genesis 3.15. He's referring to seed of the woman as the children of God and the seed of the serpent as the children of the devil. If you need more evidence that he's thinking of Genesis 3, a few verses later, he's talking about Genesis 4. And so it seems like in this part of 1 John, John's mind is on the early chapters of Genesis, because he starts talking about Cain, who murdered his brother, and how Cain was of the evil one. So, so this concept does show up in, in other places in scripture. Now, Revelation 12, and we don't have time to go through this in great detail, but when you read through Revelation 12, uh, there are several significant connections with what's going on in Romans 3.15, and it gives the expectation of the defeat of the, of the great dragon, the great serpent. So you have a woman who's giving birth. And uh, then you have the dragon. And he is trying to eliminate the person who's about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And then she gives birth to a male child. And this male child is one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. So this lady, this woman, gives birth to somebody who's going to rule the nations. And there's a dragon, uh, a great serpent, who is trying to destroy him. And then war arises in heaven. So you have these enemies involved. And Michael and his angels are fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And the great dragon was thrown down. And who is that great dragon? The great dragon is that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then, um, and then what happens is when you move into the next chapter, it gives you some more information about this. About this. And the beast comes out. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to the dragon, it gave its power and its throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. But its mortal wound was healed. So we have a dragon who is identified with Satan, who has a mortal wound on his head, but that mortal wound gets healed. So again, I think what's happening here is this is fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Now, theologically, 
we understand that there is something that happened uh, at the cross to Satan. There is a defeat of Satan at the cross. But that defeat doesn't seem to have been the final defeat. Satan is still active. Um, he is still working in the world. And so there is an expectation that there will be a final defeat of Satan. And so what it seems like is that Revelation 13 is telling us about what that final defeat is going to look like. Um, and then um, the beast continues to wage war against God's seed and his people, and uh, the beast ends up being uh, destroyed. And so that's what Paul's referring to when he is expecting uh, the God of peace to crush Satan. Um, this is a theme that comes up throughout scripture. Um, we can also we could also look at the other examples of uh, Psalm 110 um, and numerous occasions throughout the New Testament, Psalm 110 is used. Some of them indicate that um, that Jesus is currently at the right hand of God. Um, so, uh, for example, in the book of Hebrews, it talks several times about how Christ is currently at the right hand of God, but he doesn't yet ha have all of his enemies under his feet. So it's as if part of that prophecy has been fulfilled from Psalm 110, but there is a final defeat of God's enemies that will happen um, where his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. So for example, in Hebrews 10, verse 12, Christ sat down at the right hand of God. That's the first part of Psalm 110. But he's still waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So he is exalted at the right hand of God, but there is a final victory uh, that we're waiting for, uh, for him to accomplish. All right, and then um, one thing we could discuss in relation to the defeat of Satan is atonement theories. Um, there are numerous atonement theories. Um, one of them is the Christus Victor theory, where uh, Christ gave himself up sacrificially in battle uh, with Satan in exchange for rescuing mankind from Satan to defeat sin. Um, so this is sort of the classic view that the church had is that the purpose of Christ's work on the cross was to defeat Satan. Um, there are other theories uh, like the, the ransom theory, uh, the moral example theory where Christ's work on the cross was uh, to pro provide an example of self-sacrificial dedication to God. There was a moral influence theory where uh, God's love on the cross is supposed to overwhelm sinners and persuade them uh, to repent. And then there's of course the penal substitution uh, idea where Christ's death satisfies God's wrath and he takes punishment in the place of sinners. And so I think it's appropriate to think of um, not just one of those theories. I think the penal substitution theory is potentially the most critical one and it's, it's critical for us to hold to and it's what Paul presents throughout the book of Romans. Um, but there is an element to which part of the purpose of the cross was to accomplish the defeat of Satan. And this was an expectation that, uh, that Jesus had. For example, in John chapter 12, verse 31, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Uh, so there's an expectation that he is going to be defeating uh, Satan in his work on the cross. Um, but again, Satan hasn't been destroyed finally yet. Uh, it's not over yet, uh, but the, the victory is, is certain. So if we want to go back to Beale's method, um, for sake of time, I skipped going back and forth with this uh, for a little bit, but we looked at how the that Old Testament text is used throughout the Old Testament. Um, we looked at some theological aspects related to this um, in the atonement theories. Um, and then uh, the rhetorical use of the Old Testament. So again, what I think we really needed to 
uh, understand today is, is why this comes up when it does in the book of Romans. And uh, Paul, as he typically does uh, in, in numerous letters of Paul's, he is giving warnings about false teachers. And so it's important for him at the end of this incredible document, um, some say the greatest, lever ever, greatest letter ever written. At the end of this doc document, when he declares the marvelous gospel of God and gives us so much doctrinal content, he knows that people are going to be trying to, to twist that content. And he knows that they're going to be uh, resisting the true doctrine of the church that he's just presented and the true doctrine of salvation. And so he says, when those people come, watch out for them. And he says, those people are under the influence of Satan. They're accomplishing Satan's mission. But you can know, you can be assured that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's what this whole gospel, that's how this whole gospel is culminating. Um, there, is, uh, there are significant elements of it that are involved in justification and in the Holy Spirit working in believers. But the final element that Paul presents about the gospel that was presented in the Old Testament is that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And I think we'll end there. Are there any questions that we can address or don't have anything? Really good. Um, someone brought up, and uh, anyway, we can go here, or just as you guys have other questions, bring them up. Uh, but someone brought up Romans 15, 13, and some possible links there. Here, I'll just screenshot it. Uh, any thoughts here? The comment was that, so the God of hope, uh, so you're using this kind of as a, you know, the God of peace in Romans 16, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believe in you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, as the God of hope provides for us to abound in hope through the Spirit's power in our believing, so a parallel, the God of peace provides for us to abound in peace, crushing Satan through grace and faith. So anyway, does that, what do you think? Any, any uh, thing that strikes you there? Yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure about the connection with Romans 16, 20, but the God of hope, the connection with the God of hope and the God of peace with what uh, Reasoner was um, presenting. Uh, I think one thing that the Roman society valued was hope and joy and peace and faith. And all those words are next to each other in this verse. Um, and so I think those are all contributing to Paul's presentation of the gospel um, for the Romans. Um, but I think it's, it's an interesting point. There was a little bit of discussion too, and that, that also related back to the Reasoner article, um, thinking through, so like Old Testament background or biblical theology background versus cultural background and things like that. Um, anyway, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, cultural background can be so squishy and it's like you can, you can go out there and find different pieces or whatever and build up like an entire edifice of connections and stuff like that where, I don't know, anyway, uh, Old Testament background can be pinned down a little bit easier. But um, what do you think, thoughts there? Yeah, um, I generally try to avoid going into cultural background unless I, I think it's like a really clear um, connection. Um, I spent some time looking at, when I showed those coins, I had spent a good amount of time looking for, because uh, Thate had mentioned the Roman coins. And so I wanted to look that up and see, you know, what do these Roman coins really look like? And I felt like it was really significant that, you know, there is a picture of the Roman pox with his enemies under his feet on this Roman coin. Um, so I think there is some validity at times, um, but I think a lot of times people are trying to get more out of the cultural background than is really there. 
and so I think we're on we're definitely on much more much more solid ground when we're looking at the Old Testament background and the biblical background. Um, but cultural backgrounds certainly can uh, can help. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's, I have the same feeling actually. Like when you put up the initial chart and it's all this like intricate. Here's these ideas, and they're kind of yeah. it's kind of like, oh, okay. Um, but <laughs> then you put up the coins, and it was like, oh, interesting. And yeah. the the thing that was um, so at first it makes me feel like okay, so, so what? Like I see a picture of a coin, and that's like gonna convince me. But if you process it a little bit, it's like okay, so. I think the idea of something on a coin is that it's imagery that everyone sees and it's in, yeah. it's in their minds. It's not just like a bunch of abstractions, but like we pick up coins all the time that gets into your head. So anyway, I don't know. There's something there. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I thought that was cool. <laughs> that was helpful. Um, yeah. I, I tried to look at like how many times Paul uses peace uh, throughout his other letters. And he does use it relatively often. Um, but again, it is a Roman society, so perhaps throughout the Roman Empire, you know, peace is a significant concept. Um, so I just thought it was an interesting connection that, that could be relevant to think about. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the so the Genesis 15 that I just had up on the screen, actually, to me, that passage points back further to like five where, you know, so we have peace with God and therefore mm -hmm. we have hope. Um, so like hope, peace, and the spirit are all tied together. So, I mean, there's some things that are interesting like that. Yeah. Um, and then I'll just toss out one more that just pops in my mind. I, my wife and I, a couple of years ago, we got to go to the Vatican. Uh, we just like walking through the Vatican. And um, so in St. Peter's, there are multiple times you'll see this around, but it just always <laughs> visually really striking where you would have popes and underneath the popes is Satan and the Pope is crushing the head of Satan. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, anyway, that feels uh, really weird. Um, yeah. You know, it feels blasphemous in a sense because, okay, so it's like in place of Jesus because he's the vicar yeah. of Christ and he's, he's like taking that place. Um, What's kind of interesting about this text, I think I just reacted to that at that point and felt, you know, like the, the blasphemy of that, I felt that strongly. And that, that's because of the papacy connection. But I mean, if you process it in Romans, it is interesting that the role of Christ and then the seed of the woman, and that's like extended out. And it does follow this biblical theological pattern that Christ's victory has become our victory. Um, certainly you don't want to wrap that in with the Pope, but there's, there is something that's interesting there. Anyway, it's just kind of some of those complexities and how they're all orbiting around each other is intriguing. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's something of an already, but not yet element to, mm. you know, to Satan's defeat. Um, he, he's been defeated, but it's, it's not yet finalized. Uh, so uh, yeah. Yeah. That's really good. It's good. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the time. The Anyway, you put a ton of work into this and uh, that just very much comes through. So thank you for all the hard work with it. I appreciate too that we did not just get the Romans connection and not just a biblical theology connection, but also just a, a really good work through of intertextuality. We did, we did work in a previous course on intertextuality but you gave us uh, a walk through just how you would do that with a specific text. And uh, that's, that's fabulous. This is very helpful to me personally. And I know to all of us. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. So uh, we will stay back in touch with our next course and planning that out. Thank you all for your interest, your interest in God's word. <laughs> and the immense amount of time that you put into this, each one of you to study the book of Romans. And um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the privilege we had of studying this together. So I'll let us go until we join again for a different course. And uh, we'll look forward to continuing on with our studies and learning together. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.